Amen. Holy Spirit, we invite you. You're the teacher. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. We thank you that you're here. And all of God's kids said, Amen. Amen. I just want to take a moment to say, I'm so glad you are here. Everybody put it up for my friend here. Come on. <laughs> Now that we got that out of the way, <laughs> you know you love me. Come on. Uh, it's good to be back in the United States. Uh, no matter what your political differences are or what you think, it is the best country in the world. I've been to many, many countries, and it is the best country in the world. And so know that I'm very patriotic and don't ever try to burn a flag in front of me because I might lay hands on you. <laughs> oh, I'm serious. I'm not kidding. <laughs> if it offends you, buy one of my books, The Power of Forgiveness, and you too can have the power to forgive me. <laughs> Amen. But uh, while I was in Israel, um, I've made a covenant with the Lord. Now, a lot of people, I don't think, always know what a covenant is. I made a covenant where that whatever is mine... All of it is available to the Lord at his request. Whatever his is available to me at my request. And that's what a covenant is supposed to be. Uh, it's another term also for a marriage. A, a marriage should be whatever is hers is yours and yours is mine like that. It should be a partnership. But what's really sad in the body of Christ, most people only come and want from the Lord. Dear Lord, this is Jimmy. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give and they're requesting stuff, but they don't want to give stuff. If you tell them they're supposed to give stuff, then they try to say you're religious, that's Old Testament, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so I just want to encourage you, when you finally and totally surrender to the Lord, is only when you're going to begin to prosper in the Lord. Because he wants to know that your money's not an idol and you hold it in higher regards than he does. He wants to know that your wife or your children is not held in a higher regard than what he is. Go in your Bibles to the book of Judges, chapter 17, verse 6, please. Judges, chapter 17, verse 6. Now, as I travel and go not only around the world, but in the United States, I go to many churches, I happen to see stuff like this all the time. And in these days, there was no king, and everyone did what was right in their eyes. Let me read that again. In those days, there was no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And man, if that's not the body of Christ today in so many areas, they'll be like, I'll attend church, but don't ask me to tithe. They try to make an excuse, it's Old Testament. They uh, don't tell me to make all the services, and it's just like whatever I feel comfortable, whatever I feel led, uh, they believe in grace only, but there's a sovereignty to God, and there's a discipline to God. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10 through 16, please. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 10 through 16. Now, what I want to talk to you about today is it almost falls in a place of what the purpose of the church is. And I'm going to mix some experiences that I had in Israel uh, on this last trip here in January. That God, with His Holy Spirit, when you have it, you'll have gifts that work through you. But there's a difference in the gifts that Jesus gives. The Bible said that Jesus gave gifts. Those are apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists. Many denominational teachings have removed the prophet and they've removed the apostle. And it's really sad because the Bible teaches us that the foundation of the church, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. And that means, just like it says, corner. It's in the corner of the building of the foundation. Anybody that's a builder in here, but it says the foundation is apostles and prophets. The prophet is the supernatural part of the church. So if there's not any gifts working in the church, then we're not, we don't have the foundation laying in the church. The uh, apostle is the government of the church. If there is no government, someone's saying this is right, this is wrong, this is permitted, this is not permitted, then we're going to have a problem and then that church begins to be run by the people instead of by the kingdom of God. 
Ephesians chapter 4 says, verse 10, He that descendeth is the same also that ascended up from above all heaven, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith. Key word there, unity. The unity of faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lay in wait to deceive us. Many times we think it's just demons that are whispering in our ear that try to get us false doctrine and false stuff. But what they do is they whisper in somebody else's ear that's close to you, and they come to you and say, you know, that, I, I know you go to one of them churches believing that tongue stuff, but that's not for today. And they'll come and they'll whisper and try to bring you uh, teachings, and they'll try to undermine what you believe. Now this says, till we all come to the unity, so we're no more tossed to and fro and carried about. To me, this means you're no longer bipolar. Hello, somebody. Because, see, when you really have accepted the, the teaching that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, your mind's not going to be going back and forth. You're going to say, I am the righteousness. In other words, I'm in right place with God because of Christ's performance, not because of mine. Now, we all know your performance and my performance is not always going to be perfect. So praise God for 1 John 1, 9, right? Where we can say, I confess my sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here's the point of what I want to share with you tonight. Your reason for assembling in the body of Christ is so you can be equipped. My job, Karen's job, Andy's job, and other five-fold ministers, not everybody's a five-fold minister. A lot of people think they are, but they're not. I know many ministers, but they're not five-fold. I know many teachers and, and preachers, but they're not five-fold ministers. There's only a select few, and we can't select that, and we can't choose that. Jesus gives these gifts. Our job is to equip you. Now, probably some of these uh, wonderful people sitting over here, how many people from Wilson, Ohio? Okay, we're not going to hold that against you, okay? That's where I grew up and attempted to go to school, Okay. I think I made it like two weeks into 10th grade. It's about as far as I made it. But in the last, the last couple of years of going to school, when I went to school, it wasn't because I was like, man, I'm really hungry. I want to learn stuff. Teach me so I can be, really make it good in life. I'm like, dude, I have to go. Or I'm going to go to uh, juvenile detention center. Mom's going to beat me. My stepdad's going to take me to the coal shed again. I went because I had to. So when I went, I really wasn't really the teacher's pet. They didn't appreciate me because I was sleeping on the desk. I was talking to the person next to me. I was making noise so that I interrupted the class. And I wasn't there to learn. Is anybody else can relate to that? You have a cousin or a sister or brother or somebody? Well, see, if you understand God's will for you, you want to come to church saying, I'm here to be trained. I'm here to be taught. I, God didn't call me because I'm already taught, but I need to be equipped for the ministry. And here's the reason. People are really going to hell. People are really messed up, even in the body of Christ. Because a lot of people will use their faith to get their sins forgiven, but they never use their faith to get their head together. I'll just let that sink for a little bit. Head together, head together, head together, head together. You've got to think like Jesus. I wish I, I started to bring a tape measure with me, but it's in my car. When I was going to measure from ear to ear, like if I measure from her ear here to this ear here, not around, but just straight across, what would you guess? I'll let you say the size of your wife's head. Four inches, five inches? We'll say six. Six, oh, brother. <laughs> We will have an altar call for abusive husband. <laughs> She's measured her. <laughs> okay. I'm going to clue you in on something. 
Whether you believe it or not, every one of you is called into management. And always giving you six inches, four inches, five inches. You, I know you, some of you will go home and you'll have the tape measure up. You literally <laughs> be measuring your head. Just, just think about it. When you're obsessed, when you're oppressed, when you're beat down, it seems like a huge place inside here. But it's really not. You're only one decision away from saying, shut up, devil. I pull my thoughts captive. And I'm telling you, if you say that out loud, you'll be surprised how it stops immediately. Well, I got the Holy Ghost jumping all over me on that statement. It'll stop immediately. You need to say, when you get ready to open your mouth, or even if your mouth is shut, you cannot say nothing but be looking ugly. Come on, somebody. <laughs> But uh, nobody said amen. You know it's true. Some of you are looking ugly right now <laughs> as you're looking at me. Because when you've got wrong thoughts, it leaks out on your face. Amen. I mean, and in the body of Christ, you're supposed to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, not pickle juice. Some of you. I mean, come on. A lady called me a day. She goes, how are you doing? I said, I was born again doing good. And I've stayed that way. Because I'm not going to hell. But because I've allowed myself to be corrected, I've allowed myself to be trained, I've allowed myself to be taught, so I'm actually doing, now, and this is not pat me on the back, this is because my pastor wouldn't give up on me and he wouldn't quit, and I refused to quit because I said, I don't like the drug dealer that I was. I don't like the, the heathen and the punk and the terrible person that I was. I didn't like the, the paranoid schizophrenic that I was. I sought him, I prayed, I fasted, I pushed in there, until, and I got deliverance, until I'm now traveling the world and I'm setting people free. The Bible says, for this purpose was the Son of God, or the Son of Man, which is a, a Daniel prophecy talking about a glorified body, which was Jesus. So for this purpose was the Son of Man manifested to destroy the works of the devil. But you first have to destroy the works of the devil in your life. That's why so many people don't want to come to church because they see you talking, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And when your dog poops on your yard, you cuss your dog out. They hear you. <laughs> I'm surprised at the amount of Christians that think it's okay to cuss. Yeah. Oh, that's not a cuss word. Yes, it is. <laughs> I'm like, come on. I'm like, that's not a lie. Yes, it is. You know, when you come to this deliverance class, you're going to find out that your entry points for demons just read down the works of the flesh. That's why God says crucify the flesh. Not because he's trying to make you so bored that you don't have no fun. He's trying to get you to shut all the doors so the demons that you can't see can inhabit you and take care of you. And honey, there is a devil. Uh, the church that I was at in, in Nazareth, Israel, I, I was there in the apostolic government office to where the assistant pastor was causing problems in the church. And he's like, oh, God has revealed to me I no longer have to bring my tithe to the church. I just bring my tithe to God. So I sat down. I said, show me the scripture. Uh, 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 uh. I said, D all of a sudden you're stuttering. Do you need me to pray for you that you have clear speech, sir? I said, because that's a lie. And you know it's a lie. You're mad at the pastor. So you think you're going to punish him by holding back your tithes. Let me tell you something. You're not the provider of the church. Jesus Christ is. Come on, somebody. I'm just going to tell you like it is. Because I'm not one of them people that's worried about losing the vote. I'm not running for office. <laughs> Hallelujah. But this year in 2020, I'm going to see more souls saved, more bodies healed, more demons cast out, because I believe in this. You know, when you read your Bible, it says in Nazareth that he could do no mighty works. So uh, uh, because of their unbelief, there's a new generation there. While I was there, in, in a closed giveaway in the back of the church, we had two deaf mutes here and speak. In Nazareth. Whoo! I got a video. You can watch it. The guy's like, oh. he looks over to his wife. He's like, and I said, no, 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 say Jesus. And he, and he goes, Jesus. And he, and he panicked that he could hear himself or that he could talk. Because, see, this stuff is real. Church, don't look at church as a social club. Come to learn to be used first to get set free. But first, you've got to admit you've got a problem. Even if, you, even if you get court appointed to AA, you have to admit you've got a drinking problem or a drug problem. 
I've seen people be like, I ain't got a problem. I'm like, you don't know, I can do it any time I want. I don't know if they're going to have like 4K. Uh, probably the video that will be shown in heaven will be so clear and so it'll be four or five dimensional, won't it? And it'll be like, hey, check this out. I'm glad you made it in by the grace of Jesus, but look what you could have done. Wow. Wow. Look at what you were supposed to do. But, but I'm, a, I'm just, I used to sleep around all the time and, and, and I did drugs and, and I was just, I was, no, no. That's because you have believed that you're the righteousness of God. Until you believe the righteousness of God, then you'll believe I'm healed. You can't believe you're healed until you believe you're the righteousness of God. You can't believe that you're prosperous until you're the righteous. Because as long as you allow thoughts in your head saying, I'm not worthy, I'm not right. I was talking to one of my friends the other day. I said, why don't you keep coming up for healing? Because I'm worried about what people are going to say about me. I said, well, how come you're not worried about what I'm going to say? My goodness. You know, for, for going on close to 30 years, I've been trying to make this woman mad, and I haven't accomplished it yet, so I keep trying. I don't give up. <laughs> oh, wrong, wrong situation. Shouldn't have used that story. <laughs> Does that make sense? You, you know, when you're recording the woman you like, if she played hard to get you, it's like, oh, well. You just kept going. You got to keep to it. Don't be a person when they die, so we put on your tombstone and says, I told you I was sick. <laughs> I'm believing that if someone comes where I'm buried, if Jesus doesn't come back and tarry, they come back and they touch the tombstone, they're going to jump up healed. Come on. come on. It's biblical. But actually, I want my gravesite to be the poorest gravesite on the planet. There's not one prophetic song left. There's not one message left. There's not one book left. Everything that the Spirit of God gives me, I've learned to release it and to let it go because I'm not falling for the lie of the devil that I'm dirty, I'm disgusted, I'm nobody, I'm just an old sinner. No, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Shut up, devil. And anybody that the devil's used to talk, I don't care. Someone told me the other day, I know some stuff about you. I said, well, get on my website and watch the DVD of my testimony and you'll find out some stuff you don't know. <laughs> Karen always used to say, tell it all and the devil's got nothing to say. Right. Glory to God. <laughs> this guy refused. He told his pastor, I don't have to listen anymore. I get all my revelation from heaven. So I said, you got two opportunities, sir. I've now become the apostolic leader of this church in Israel. And we've had a board meeting. We've started a new board. And you're not on it. <laughs> and we've come to a decision. And this is our decision. You cannot be in leadership in this church unless you're under the authority of this pastor. And unless you're tithing, you cannot hold a position this thing. And I said, so I need you by the end of the day to tell your decision. Do you want to repent? Do you want to get right with God? And I gave him multiple scriptures. By the end of the day, we had service. He left without talking to me. So I told the pastor, he's done. I fire him. That's called apostolic government. It was a cancer that thought it could do, just like that first scripture, whatever's right in their own eyes. That, that had to be cut out because he was going to other people and other people were listening to him, and they're like, we're just so happy for him that he can do whatever he wants, and nobody can tell him what to do. Not going to happen here, do you think? <laughs> because that's not Jesus' way. The church is a body that's supposed to come to allow themselves to be trained. You can't look at the teachings as a buffet. Well, I'll take some of that prosperity. And, well, I need some forgiveness of sin this week. <laughs> Give me a double portion of that. I don't want none of them tongues. Or, I, I don't eat cow tongue. I don't want no Holy Ghost tongue. Keep them, <laughs> keep them tongues away from me. <laughs> you, you need to do the first time in your life praying a holy, pure language you've never cussed in and sinned in. You need to get some holiness. 
So I travel in Africa and, and Pakistan and all these places where a demon takes over a person, the demon talks through that person. Because when they have control, they take control of their tongue. How come you're not allowing God to talk to you? Shabbat, baby. I don't understand it. Well, nobody can understand you when you talk English. <laughs> you ain't been making sense for most of your life. Come on. You know you're a hillbilly redneck from the Appalachian region. Say amen. amen. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't get offended. Grow up. There was a five-fold board at a church. And in that five-fold church, there was a guy, and he was just a sinner. He just, I mean, this boy could not stop sinning. If he was with a guy, he'd be with a guy. If he was with a girl, he'd be with a girl. If he was with if he drugs, he'd do drugs. If he was with alcohol, he'd do alcohol. If it, if it was a big party, he just did it all. He'd come in crying, man, you guys got to help me. And there was an apostle, and there was a prophet, there was a pastor, a teacher, and an evangelist. He said, please help me. They're all sitting there in their suits and looking pretty. And the, the apostle stood up and said, son, you don't understand the government of God nor the purpose of the church. If you understood that, you would get your act together. He sat down. Just in his tie. The prophet stood up and said, No, no, that's not what it is. You've never truly had a prophetic word from heaven. A prophetic word from heaven will clear your mind, drive the devils out of you, and you'll be doing good. He sat down. The teacher jumped up and said, I have a 10 CD teaching. If you'd listen to my teaching, I got a series. If you'd listen to my series, the pastor jumped up and said, Shut up, everybody. Leave him alone. He just needs love. Come here, let me hug you. And the evangelist jumped up and said, no, you heathen, you need to get saved. <laughs> so we all kind of get blinded and we kind of, through our gifts and through our ideal. But as my pastor always says, it takes five to survive. All five of the gifts of those apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, the evangelist is a person that stirs you up to witness and to invite people to church and, and to bring, bring people so that they can become born again. But once they become born again, we now got to nurture them and give them milk. And after a while, you got to go past milk. I've got a little granddaughter somewhere, probably in the back, back office somewhere. She was used to just do milk and formula. Now she's starting to do some cereal and, and she, she's starting to do a little bit of fruit. It's funny to watch a baby when they get sugar for the first time. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that was, but mommy, give me some more. Oh. It's like me Tuesday morning when I find them brownies hanging on my door. I'm like, oh, Jesus, you do love me. Glory to God. This time they had walnuts in them. <laughs> we got to allow ourselves to be trained because you have a purpose, you have a plan. You see yourself belittled by listening to the echo of the thoughts of the devil that has cut you down or your mother, your father, your brother, your sister or somebody. But I want to tell you today what Jesus says about you. I got a purpose. I got a plan. My thoughts for you are good. Woo! Somebody might need to say amen. amen. Everybody told me I was the most likely to go to prison. I was the most likely to overdose. I was a high school dropout, but not anymore, baby. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Don't confuse my confidence in Jesus with arrogance and self. Because I know apart from him, I was just an old burnout drug dealer. Just a I, I mean, I'd rip myself off. <laughs> Two. When I, I had so many personalities, this one personality, he'd steal from me. He was terrible. I'm glad I kicked him out. Glory to God, that nasty old thing. He had a foul mouth, too. I remember I'd hear him cussing inside another one. He'd be like, you shouldn't be talking like that. Your mama might hear you. <laughs> but now, because of the power of Jesus, I'm getting set free and I only got two voices, the Holy Ghost and my wife's. Take the trash out. Take the trash out. Cut the grass. <laughs> you must come to church or you're coming to a college. Come with a teachable heart. What's really sad is some people I've seen come to church and they come like they're the fourth member of the Godhead. God has sent me to bring revelation to this church. No, that's not his nature. That's not how he works. The tail doesn't speak to the head. Come on. 
Oh, did I say that? <laughs> God puts ears on the head, the leaders of the church for the corporate body. Now, you'll be able to hear for yourself and, and for your light. If not, then you need to learn, and we want to teach you. But allow yourself to be trained. Allow yourself to be equipped. Not to be equipped just so you and your four is blessed, but so that you can share your testimony, so you can pray for the sick, so you can show people and become the visible image of the invisible God. Amen. That you can show people that he's a good God and not a lightning bolt God. But I'm telling you, there's a day coming. He is coming back. And there's a day coming where you're going to have to stand before him. And when he says, why didn't you do it? You're not going to be able to say, my wife wouldn't let me. Because you're going to turn around, your wife ain't going to be there. She's going to already be through the gate saying, I hope you make it. <laughs> when you're young, you don't even think about the possibility of dying until you stand in front of the coffin of another young person. I tell you, as I get older, I think more about death, and I think more about the other side, and I think about, you know, I got to keep myself in shape better, and I got to drink more water, and I got to watch what I do. Why? Because I know I haven't fulfilled the call of God on my life. When are you going to fulfill the call? Do you think your call is just to warm a seat? You're not called to just to be a spectator. You're called to be a participator. Some of you right now, the enemy's just whispering in your head, well, that might be for somebody else. Then it's not for me. You don't know all the problems I have. You don't know all the medical problems I have. Hey, let me put on a video of a guy who's got no arms and legs and he travels the world and preaches. Come on. I remember the first time I saw him, first thing I was thinking is, how does he clean himself when he goes to the bathroom? You know, weird thoughts go to my mind. I don't know about you. But he didn't let this situation in his life. He didn't let what was supposed to be bad in his life getting down. Somebody said something. I got hurt in church. You got more hurt in the bars than you got hurt in the church. But you went back to the bars. Your drug dealer cut your stuff more than he told you he cut it, but you still kept going back to him. I don't understand. The bar's watered down. The, you think you're getting a good whiskey. It's watered down. Somebody spit in your cup and you go back. When you live for just yourself, that's what you'll be judged by. I'm not trying to give you a doom and gloom message. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. Because you'll hear the truth, and the truth will set you free. Oh, you're too old. Don't tell me you're too old. I'm older. But I'm still traveling the world, and I'm going to go to many countries this year, more countries than I did before, and next year, next year, next year. I'm not letting the gray hair stop me. Because I operate by the power of the Holy Ghost. If you'll begin to take your place, if you'll begin to obey the Word of God, you can be free. Bless that little guy, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I wouldn't want to listen to my preaching either, buddy. I'm sorry. It's all right. Somebody get him a bottle of water or something if he wants something to drink. Father, in Jesus' name, bless my little buddy. Hey, man, you remember being a kid? I do. It's hard. Don't expect a child to be 30 or 40 years old. I learned that as a grandpa, man. I about strangled two of mine the other night. I told Karen, don't let them both be in the same room at the same time again. <laughs> Have you ever been there? It's all right. He'll be fine. Jesus loves the world so much that he sent his son. Do you think he stopped loving the world? If he still loves the world, then he's still sending his sons. It doesn't matter if you have piercings. It doesn't matter if you have tattoos. It doesn't matter if you're a high school dropout. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're a little slow upstairs, because I've always been slow. That's how I caught myself. That's how Karen caught me. Hallelujah. I slowed down for her, though. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> but
but he wants to use you. But like my prophet friend always says, God loves babies, but God can't use babies. Some people 30, 40 years in church, but they're little babies. They, they get offended at the drop of a hat. You know, the same thing that offends you tries to offend me. And I just kind of close my eyes for a second and say, I pull my thoughts captive in the name of Jesus. Lord, my wife is only flesh and blood. I just, I just release her right now. I just let it go. Lord, I know one day you're going to deal with her. She'll be judged by you. <laughs> Hallelujah. I honor her for her position. I'll let you judge her performance. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to set this guy down and I had to set down some people in the praise room of this church and I just became the apostolic leader. What a way to come in like a doctor and cut away the cancer. The pastor's wife came to the board meeting when we set up the new board when we'd already made decisions to do this. She said, for, for over a year, I've lost my song and she was the praise leader. She said, the song of my heart the joy of the Lord, it was gone. She said, but coming to the meeting today, she said, I found myself singing in my kitchen. Because she, she said, I knew government and order was coming to the house. One night the Lord woke me up and, well, it was actually toward the morning in between that sleep and wake up zone, you know where that's at, where sometimes you hear from God. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me so clear and he said, he said, you're my doctor. That's what he said. He goes, you're my doctor, my apostolic healer. I will send you to churches that are broke down and pastors that are hurt, and I'll use you to bring healing. Because see, so many people always crying about how they got hurt, and the only reason they got hurt is because they were babies and they were immature, not, majority of the time, not always, not everybody. I know there's times where real things will happen, but a lot of times it's stuff that when you get older, you'll be like, ah, why did I let that bug me? You know, you know what I'm saying? You look back years later, you're like, that was stupid, man. I do that with myself all the time. Why did I let that bug me? I mean, used to be years ago, I would never let Andy in the pulpit with tennis shoes on or someone on the stage with tennis shoes on or a T-shirt with a pocket with, with, with junk road across there, you blasphemer. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my goodness. I mean, because in my immaturity, in my youth, I was taught to honor the law but I wasn't taught to honor the law of love. The prodigal son, the brother that stayed home, he sinned against the law of love because he couldn't love his brother to, to let him come back. The, the prodigal son, he sinned against morality and, and he slept around and he drank and he did stuff wrong. That was, uh, he sinned against morals, but it was a greater law called the law of love and his, his older brother was guilty of that. And as I, as I laid in the basement of this place where I stayed, I cried out, God, what, what, what is attacking this church? What's happening? And he spoke to me. And you're going to begin to hear probably maybe a two or three series in the future. And he says, it's, a, it's an orphan spirit, Brian. It's an orphan spirit. And so I Googled, I uh, uh, got on Amazon and, and downloaded a couple of books on the orphan spirit. And, and I started reading them. And about 15 minutes into reading them, <laughs> I'm crying and sobbing. And God says, that's your problem, son. You have an orphan spirit. You see, the minute a father's love is not be given correctly, it leaves a void and it summons that orphan spirit to come upon you. And you can have a father that was too hard or too harsh. He didn't love you the way you needed to be loved, but that's how his dad taught him that he was supposed to be a man of love. And so when that orphan spirit gets on you, you're just like, yeah, my daddy, don't tell me what to do. You think you can just come and go, and that's what these guys are saying. I don't have to bring my tithes here. I don't have to do what the pastor says. I don't have to listen to him. And here he was separating himself. The, the uh, prodigal son, you know what he did? He said, I want what belongs to me. I want my inheritance, but I don't want a relationship with the father. And he severed that relationship with the father. And today, I see it all over the world. People come in and say, I read in the scripture where it says I can have tongues and it says I can have the working of miracles and the gifts of healing and, and I can be prophetic. And, and they're like, I want my inheritance. But they spend no time praying for the Father. And they take the gifts and they work in them. That's why that one scripture says, depart from me, I never knew you. Because the gifts are available. They're without repentance. They can never be taken from the church. So the doctrine that the gifts are gone is a lie because it says they can't be taken. 
But have you taken the gifts or are you reaching for the prosperity? Are you trying to get just enough deliverance so that you have peace in your heart? And now no more. Because if I take another step, it seems like the devil always comes messing with me. Two steps forward, I get shoved ten steps back. I always tell people, that's for you common core math people. But real mouth says, you're only eight steps back because you took two forward. It's not as bad as what you think it is. <laughs> By the book, don't get mad, math teacher. <laughs> you know, I've been watching some UFC fights, little clips and stuff. Guy got whipped really bad. They said, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going back to the gym, baby. I'm going to come back and I'm going to take him. I said, I love his spirit. A don't quit spirit. A don't quit attitude. God wants you not to quit. But you're going to lose battle after battle after battle if you don't have the right trainer or if you don't allow yourself to be trained. Some people say, well, you know, I really feel God sent me here to bring some correction. That's not God's nature. It's not how God's work. It's not what God does. I come to be trained. Expect yourself. The Bible says these signs follow those that believe. It says follows all those that believe. If you haven't cast out a devil, we're going to set up a dam. We'll bring all my grandkids over here and you guys can come practice. <laughs> and my wife. <laughs> What's that, ma'am? You're going to volunteer your husband too? Oh. <laughs> We're called to be trained. You know, on Facebook, you'll, you'll see those things come up, and they'll say memories, maybe from two years ago, five years, ago, seven years. They come up on mine all the time, I'm like, Dude, I forgot about that miracle. There was a guy in, in uh, Ghana, Africa, that had been in a wheelchair for 20 years, and he couldn't move his legs or nothing from the waist down. I prayed for him, and he starts, I said, kick the devil. He starts kicking his leg. Then he gets up out of the wheelchair, and I get him to hang on to it, because so, when you're weak, when you haven't walked for 20 years, he starts pushing the wheelchair. I get in it, and I'm like, come on, push me. Well, I guess I was just a little bit too big for him to push me. <laughs> I, I believe in miracles, but the guy needed a little practice. He must not have had faith like I did. Because <laughs> I get here and go, uh, uh, uh. I'm like, well, I guess I'm too big. <laughs> the eight-year-old boy that stood and stared at me when I went to the Congolese church this last trip to Africa, I said, who is that boy? Why does he keep staring at me? And the pastor says, eight years ago you prayed for his mother. He was dead in his mother's womb for two weeks, no moving, and she prayed every day, God, don't let this baby leave my, my womb. And I laid hands on him and said, Andy was with me. Andy was there. Matter of fact, in the picture I'm praying for, I, I said, whoa, Andy was with me on that trip. We were, we were at, the, at, the, at the mall in South Africa. We we're sitting in the corner of this thing, eating a nice little steak dinner, and all of a sudden they have, they have a beautiful accent. Dr. Bryant, is that you? I'm like, cheerio, chap, yes it is. <laughs> I love to mess with them. <laughs> and I look at her and I'm like, I have no idea who this lady is, man. And she goes, three years ago, I came into your meeting like this. I'd been run over by a car, and, and my bones broke and didn't heal right, and I was crippled. She said, but look at me now. Three years later, I'm still healed, no pain. I'm like, oh, praise God. I go to this church, and this little girl comes and stands and just stares at me. I'm at my book table. I'm like, hi, kid. <laughs> I'm not your daddy. <laughs> What's that, Michael Jackson? <laughs> the kid is not my son. <laughs> And she just stares at me. And, and all of a sudden, this other lady steps over, and I'm like, I remember the mother. And I said, I said, she goes, she was born deaf, and then somebody else's meeting, she started to hear a little bit in one ear, but was deaf in the other ear. Then she lost the healing again. You came here about three or four years ago. You preached, and, and she, her ears are open, and she's heard perfect. I said, oh, man, and she still kept her healing. That's awesome. That's so wonderful. And another lady came and grabbed my hand. She goes, you got to come outside. 
and it was in where the church is in the worst gang area of South Africa. I'm like, I got to come outside. I'm about to get mugged. I'm thinking in my head. I'm like, I pulled that thought captain. I'm a big guy. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm from Wellston. No one mess with me. <laughs> I drank the water there with a straw from Lake Elmo. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I really did. She's looking at me like, oh, that's so gross. <laughs> She takes me out to this car that's parked outside the door. And there's two or three girls in the back seat. And there's a girl there, probably about 13 girls. She goes, see that little girl right there? I said, yeah. She goes, three years ago, the same time you prayed for her, she had never spoken in her life. And she looks at me and goes, how are you with that accent? I said, oh, I'm just doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> and the other girl sitting beside her, she goes, she hasn't shut up since. <laughs> I used to stand on the street corner in Wilson selling joints. Now I travel the world healing joints, elbow joints, back joints. That God would even use me. Tens of thousands of people were saved last year in Brian Adams Ministries. We're believing for a quarter million this year because I'm believing to do some TV. 250,000, that's just a start. But I didn't get from where I was to where I am because I had it together. I got there because I didn't have it together and I acknowledged that and I allowed my pastor to train me. And I listened when Andy preached, I listened when Karen, because they each have different gifts and I listened to other ministers. And, I, and, and, and I'm the type of person that I'll go to Andy, I'll go to Karen. These guys are underneath, I'm the, uh, as a senior guy, I would go to them and say, write down five things that I need to change. Mandy was very nice. Karen was terrible. I had to call 911 when I read her. I was like <laughs> bleeding and didn't want to talk to her for two days. And I'd be like sitting there with my eyes closed. I told her to tell me. I told her to tell me. It's my fault. It's my fault. Don't get mad. Pull your thoughts captive. You love her. You got a covenant with her. Don't get her mad. She's got all the passwords to your bank accounts. <laughs> Sometimes you just can't see what you're doing wrong. So if you'll listen to the preaching. But some of you, I hear that Holy Spirit, yes. Some of you were like I used to be. You're afraid of failure. Because your whole life's been based on performance and you perform to the best of your ability to be accepted. And if you fail, then you won't be accepted. But if you know Christ has already accepted you, it doesn't matter if everybody else rejects you. Even in the Marine Corps, they'd say, man, you're doing so wonderful. We're going to put you up for promotion. And I would go, and I'd go unauthorized leave. Uh, and I'd get in a fight. I'd do something to keep myself from being promoted because I'm like, it's just too much responsibility. And all I could hear was my stepdad saying, everything you do is wrong. I tried so to get it so perfect. And I'm like, they're, they're liking me right now. If, if I go to another level. I was so afraid of that other level. You don't know what I mean, do you? I'm preaching to you, brother. You made a really dumb mistake. You came to me and said, do whatever it takes. He said, do whatever it takes. Get all the demons out of me. He said, I got your back. I said, well, son, if you're proclaiming you got devils, I don't want you behind me. I want you in front of me where I can watch you. I'm like, duh. I'm like, hey, too, Brute. If you know Shakespeare. I was so afraid of the next level. My God. Can I tell you what I found on the next level? My destiny, my calling. You know what I found at the next level? That the reason I was so performing so bad on this level because it wasn't where I was supposed to be. 
You know what? Can I tell you what else I found on the next level? That little girl that was deaf. Wow. Oh, man. The guy in the wheelchair for 20 years. The thousands of little kids running to the altar, looking up in broken English, saying, I want your Jesus. Wow. Little boy in Nicaragua. He's, he's a drummer on the praise team down there. Now he's grown up. But he showed up in a little black suit and tie. And everybody else was just in ripped jeans and clothes because everybody's poor. And here's the nicest dressed kid. And, and the grandmother brought him up. And, and I said, well, doesn't he look nice? And she says, he had a dream last night. I said, what dream is that? He said, I had a dream. And God told him he's going to be like you. And what I found at the next level, my deliverance, my sanity. Oh, I'm not perfect yet. I'll never forget the day I was taking Karen somewhere to spend money on her, try to bless my wife. She looked over and said, I'm so glad you're not a finished product. <laughs> and I thought, I don't think that was a compliment. <laughs> You remember that? I mean, but I understand her teaching expression. <laughs> She'd got a revelation. I love him, but by faith, I, I'm believing he gets better. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, that's why we're kind of like that. <sighs> what if <laughs> when the government and your taxes... You're really, really older people. When your taxes were paying for me to go to school, it was a waste of your tax dollar. <laughs> now that I'm, I'm doing Oral Roberts University and I've got a doctorate degree and I'm paying for this, man, I'm paying for it. I study. I sit in my office long and I'm listening to Greek and Hebrew now. And, and, uh, and someone said, well, how you doing? I'm like, dude, it's all Greek to me. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm learning a lot from these professors. And what I found on the next level was I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I didn't have to stay a high school dropout from Wilson, Ohio. To, I went from a high school dropout to another doctorate degree to now I've got a couple of other uh, diplomas and stuff coming from Royal Roberts University. I got diplomas coming from, uh, I just started while I was in Israel, an Israeli uh, Hebrew uh, school classes that the teachers. I'm not learning the language so much to speak as they're just teaching me from the original and, and doing this. And I'm watching class after class after class because I, I, I want to know him. And all of a sudden, on, on the next level that I'm just starting to go to, there's a scripture. I hear Jesus saying, I pray that you'll be one with the Father like I'm one with the Father. And all of a sudden I thought, wait a minute. I can be one with him like, like Jesus, like you was? Come on, Jesus. Come allow yourself to be equipped. No one's inviting you to a place. Let me put it like this. Let me put it in the Brian Adams uh, translation. Yo, yo, home girl, listen to me. You don't have to live in bondage. You can have the victory. Amen. You're seated in heavenly places. And Christ is seated in prosperity. He's seated in healing. From the time of John the Baptist even until now, the violent take the kingdom violently. You've got to take it violently. You've got to press in for it. You've got to press in for it. I saw Sylvester Sloan being uh, uh, interviewed the other day, and the guy goes, I mean, he's looking old, dude, but I mean, but for an older guy, he's doing it with class. <laughs> with still all his rips and looking muscular. But he's like looking really old, and, and the, the guy interviewed him said, hey, is there going to be another Rocky? He goes, well, he goes, yo, like, uh, you know, I could see me getting in the ring saying, come on, Artie, arthritis, come on, I'm going to fight you. <laughs> <laughs> and when he said that, of course, I laughed because he's doing that Italian accent. <clears throat> and all I could think is, is that needs to be you. I'm going to fight you, arthritis. I'm not going to give in to you. I don't want my mama's death. My mama... I remember when she died, 
the monitor still showed her heartbeat, and I'm like, dude, how can she be dead? And the monitor still beat. And then they said she's got a pacemaker. And they had to take a thing to make the battery stop for the monitor to stop. And I realized, you know what? I don't want my mama's devils. I'm not going to have a pacemaker. I'm going to set the pace. Because my maker has given me the Holy Ghost. The less qualified you feel, the more you're qualified to be filled. <laughs> because God likes to, someone asked me, I was, I was at a place and there was all these apostles and prophetesses. Every apostle's wife was a prophetess and I was cracking on them. I said, man, I can't find the Bible where every apostle's wife is a prophetess. And, and I said, do you guys just do this because you like titles or what? Oh, they were mad. They didn't like it at all. <laughs> But I was having fun laughing at them because it was ridiculous. They weren't real apostles and prophets. They just had a title. because It's a big thing in Africa. And uh, they said, what do, you, uh, uh, what do you call yourself? I said, Brian. So <laughs> 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 my mama called me, you know. <laughs> they asked me who my favorite preacher was. And I said, me. Well, see, they, you think I'm joking, but I can't get away from myself. I've tried. <laughs> I came close to killing myself one time. That's how I got saved. And the Lord kind of let me know, you'll be there too with you <laughs> when you die. And so I've, I've got to learn to love myself because I'm with me all the time. I've got to believe that what Christ said has happened to me supernaturally, spiritually, it's true that I am the righteousness of God. So if I really have this identity that I'm the righteousness of God, then I'm not the sick of God. I'm not the broke of God. Come on, somebody. I mean, supernaturally, the funds that come into Brian Adams' ministry blows me away. From people that I don't even preach to. They're like, ha! <laughs> it's crazy. And here's why. Because I cease to strive for provision. I don't like, how am I going to get breakfast? I know how I'm going to get breakfast. God speaks to a woman that owns chickens. Wow. And she brings me eggs. <laughs> and I tell my wife, go with thereeth and getteth me jalapeno cheddar sausage. I mean, God takes care of me, man. I don't strive over the money to go to Africa. I don't strive over it. I just say, Lord, by faith, I thank you. I thank you. Let me give you... Jesus said this statement. He said, have faith in God. The Greek word is pistos. <laughs> Does that make me sound cool? <laughs> <laughs> Do you like the other day when I was reading hard word, hard word, hard word? I said, how smart I am. <laughs> I couldn't pronounce them, so I said hard word. But it's a Greek word. Feature. You know what it means? I'd never heard this before. It means to trust. So Jesus was saying, trust God. Wow. That, doesn't that make it look so different? Have faith in God. Most of us are like, I don't even know what faith is. <laughs> but have trust in God that he didn't send his son to die so that you could be sick or so you could be poor. But the power of death and life is in your tongue and the kingdom is voice activated and according to what you say is according to what you're going to have. I always say and sing, I will have abundance. Uh, have you seen God do supernatural finances? in our ministry. And guess what? I don't try to understand it. That's where many people mess up. And I don't think the same person is always going to be used by God to bless me the next time. But how am I going to use it? Am I going to be a good steward of it? Am I going to be a good steward of the gift of healing? Do I believe it enough that I'll apply it to myself? $4,000 
four or five times a week, my back, I wake up with my back out. I'll sit up, drop my arms and legs, go get my hot tub, like, oh, Jesus, it's miracle water. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? I don't have a bit of problem with taking two uh, ibuprofen with, uh, with uh, anti-inflammatory in it. Just make sure they're not PM when you're driving. <laughs> I did that one time, took four of them. Drove all the way to Arizona. I'm like, what? why am I so sleepy? That's a crazy story in itself. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a fairy tale. Please don't allow church to be a history lesson. Don't let it be about a story that you think about a man that used to live. Every time I go to Israel, I, I peek in the grave. <laughs> it's empty, man. That's such a trip. Amen. I stood over on the hill that they were going to throw him off when he preached his first sermon. I looked behind me, there was Nazareth. I, I looked ahead of me, there was Mount Gilboa where Gideon and his 300 hid. And there's the Armageddon in front of me where the Midianites were all there by the thousands. I, I looked over at Mount Tabor to my left. That's where Jesus transfigured. And it just brought such a reality to it. And someone said, does that make it seem so real? I said, a little bit. I said, but what really makes it real is when I step out of the boat. I'll never forget the time I was playing deputy sheriff. I was all blocked out in my SWAT gear. Had an automatic weapon, sw weapon swung around the back, my Glock 9mm on my, on, my, on my leg holster right here. I come home and she's crying. Such a deep cry that I thought one of the kids must have been hurt because it was like a cry I hadn't seen. And I said, tell me what to, and I, it was so macho back then. Woman of mine. <laughs> macho and religious. Telleth me of what has happened to her. <laughs> no, I didn't get King James. I'm kidding about that. I'm like, what's going on? She wouldn't stop crying. Finally, I grabbed her and shook her. You'll tell me what's going on. And I was just having fun being me and playing cops. And she shook me. Well, I shook her. What she said shook me. She said, don't you care about the hundreds of thousands of souls attached to your call? Take a chance. Nathaniel, we found him. You know, the one that Moses talked about. The Messiah. Who is it? It's Jesus of Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Come and see. Marty. <laughs> is there something you ate? <laughs> The devil don't want this sermon preached tonight, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and Nathaniel said, can anything good? Lord, I take authority over this room right now. And he said, can anything good come from Nazareth? And I like his evangelistic reproach. He simply said, come and see. So when you're telling people about the anointing and the flow that's out to the Rock Church, you're like, man, I've heard stuff about that church. Can anything good happen? Say, just come and see. Isn't that so easy? It didn't take Bible school. It didn't even take enough. Ever even opened the Bible to say, come and see. The reason I'm drawn to you, child, don't be afraid. I'm not trying to embarrass you. But I am, aren't I? I don't have to try it. I can do it. I'm telling it. It's my gift. The reason I'm drawn to you is because you're so important. You have a destiny. And God wants your attention because he's got much to say to you and he has much healing for you because you have hurt in your soul. And you are wondering, where was it, Jesus, when this stuff happened? And Jesus said, the same place I was when they did what they did to my son. 
He loves you, baby. So, so important. Me and my wife will always be your friend. We always want to be available for you if you need to talk. But you have a destiny. And you're so afraid to go to the next level. And, because I think inside you, you know, you hear. You hear him knocking at your door, don't you? Can I pray with you? You said, I don't know or no? I don't know. Well, that's better than no. <laughs> Since you don't know, I do know. No problem. If you ever need to talk, just call me. Five, 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 five. <laughs> they got the number. She's just so special. I mean, sometimes people just stand out to me, and I'm like, there's a reason for that. Not just to torment and embarrass them, but there's a real reason. To teach them and to train them and to take them to that place where you become the answer to people's prayers because you know the pain, you know the hurt. So you'll have compassion for people that have the same, that, that push me, pull you, that, that am I, am I not, and, and all that warfare that's, that's in your head. Man, we can help answer that question. And, and the spirit that torments you, I have authority to make it leave. So when you're just like, I need a big brother. Yo, yo, come help me. Call in the artillery, the cavalry. See them guns? I got a license for that. Everybody close your eyes right now. Just relax. Take it a little faster. I want you just to relax. The beginning of receiving is relaxing. this church here in Jackson. Holy Spirit, come. You're the anointed one that can change our life. Holy Spirit, I pray today you'll change us in a very special way. Lord, we need you now. Holy Spirit, come. Let us receive your spirit now. I pray. Listen to me real quickly. You say, Brian, you don't have to call me apostle, you don't have to call me doctor, you don't have to call me pastor, you just call me Brian. You say, Brian, I want to accept my call. I want to begin to make a decision to show up, to be equipped, to not pretend, but to actually become what God has called me to be. Raise your hand right now, all over the room. If you want to accept your call, you want to quit playing games and quit listening to the lying excuses of the devil. Stand to your feet if that's you right now. Holy Spirit, come in this place today. I pray. Come on, quickly out of your seat. Come down here, just a group around me. Holy Spirit, come. I pray in the name of the Son. Oh, come on, come on in. Come in, just come into me. Come, come. Holy Spirit, come. Everybody raise your hands up high. If you're at your seat and you should have been up here, you can raise your hands at your seat. You're all under arrest. 
<laughs> In other words, when I say you're under arrest, I'm saying I'm taking you from the darkness. And he's called you out of darkness. You're doing a little bit of it. You ain't saying nothing yet. There's new levels. And don't listen to that old religious saying, new level, new devils. Because at every level, you have authority over every devil. Did you hear me? We've been given power and authority to trample the serpents and scorpions and over all the power of all the enemy at every level, at every place. When you become tarred, you'll put your foot down and you'll say, no devil, it's done. Oh, I got pains, I got problems, I got kids, I got grandkids. Well, so the heck does everybody else in the world? They're using excuses and take authority of your life so they can see God working through you and they'll say, their God is real. And then because, see, it's got to quit being your God, it's got to become her God. It's got to quit being my God and eventually my grandkids it's going to have to become their God. Because right now it's grandpa's church and grandma's church and, and you know, my daddy's church. But it's got to eventually, one day, you got to become theirs. Put your hands up, say, Father, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe Jesus is his name. I believe he died for my sins. And he raised from the dead. I make a decision to be trained, to submit myself, to be trained, to be equipped, to come into unity. Now, in Jesus' name, I'm not going to play around with attendance, with tithing, with any excuse. I'm going to be on fire for Jesus. And all of God's kids said, put your hands together for the Lord. Now, here's a scenario. You get in the car, you start to drive home. And you hear this voice, he didn't really mean that. <laughs> and then you say, here's what you do. You pull the car over, you put it in park, you open the door, you get out to the passenger door, and you say, get out, devil. Get out. I did that one time, and when I got done kicking the devil in my car, I turned around, there was a state trooper. <laughs> He's looking at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> hey, man. You made a decision, I'll stick with it. It's not a resolution. It's just the solution. And, and, and by golly, if I can do it, you can do it. And, and, and I've had to go to people and ask for help. I messed up. And, and, and you, can, you can get that help. Here. I don't want to have to do your food. you can make the decision. Only you can make the choice. But you've got to believe that you're worthy, that he chose you. I know that's hard, but why would I lie? I break the power of the word spoken against you right now in Jesus' name. I break that assignment. Boy, you fought hard to get back, didn't you? I'm proud of you. We ain't care we're proud of you, aren't we, Karen? Put your hands up, because you're about to get blasted. You need it, don't you? I command every pain, every assignment, every generational curse to be broken now. Oh, there's an angel with a sword cutting off all the chains right now. There it is. Three, two, one. Jesus' name. Kind of favoring that arm, ain't you? No, I don't. I think you died. You broke my neck. Just okay, my hurt. Just my Okay. Okay. Did you pray that prayer? Making Jesus your Lord tonight? Okay. Say this prayer now. Say this prayer now. Say, I forgive you. I forgive the person that beat me. 
Say it with words. I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you. It doesn't mean what he did was right. It just frees you. Say, I forgive him. It's all right. Karen, come stand with me, will you please? Say, I forgive myself. It's so important, honey. It's so important. Here it goes. Is there pain there? I got the germ just in within my neck. Yeah, my Okay, just put it down. Just put it down. Relax it. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. I break every assignment, the paralytic spirits. I command the muscles, ligaments, and tendons to relax right now. Arthritis, bursitis, fibromyalgia, leave this body right now. In Jesus' name. Excuse me, be cool. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Spirits that came in during this trauma, I break your power. You come out now. I take authority over you in the name of Jesus Christ. Go! In the name of Jesus. Yes, you ain't nothing to Jesus. Put your hands up. Say, thank you, Jesus, for helping me forgive. Just a little higher. Just a little higher. Jesus' name. That's a little bit better than you was. That's all right. I break this witchcraft curse. Did anybody notice this arm going higher? That's all right. I plead the blood of Jesus over you. The enemy can't get to the blood. Power. Put it down. Now look at me, like this. Put it down. Bring it up. You can do it. Open and close your hand. Yeah. <laughs> that good. That's going to be cute. Okay. I command the bones to knit together right now in Jesus' name. All the trauma in the mind, all the tormenting demons, I break your power now. You loose her now. Loose her. Loose her. I said, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Your power is broken. Power, let me do it, not you. Give me control. The anointing's leaving my hands, sister. It's going to free that neck. Feel a weak, aren't you? swing on me now. <laughs> That's a relative, I can tell now. That feels better, doesn't it? It's all right, it's all right. Don't worry about that. You got to have peace in your soul. Say, Jesus, forgive me for every sin. Let me go right now. Torment, your power is broken now. See, when you go through situations, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. He comes to take all your peace. He comes to get you addicted. He gets you to escape reality through any means but by the Spirit of God. And he wants you to be free. This summer, I'm celebrating 35 years drug free, man. Come on, somebody. Not by AA, by Jesus Christ. We'll give him praise one more time. You're dismissed. If you need additional prayer.